Hello everyone, welcome to our channel, welcome to Agapen TV, you are right on Agapen TV. I brought you this powerful message from a very large man of God, Apostle Michael Erobo, the three demonic things that stop men. This message, you are going to learn a lot and it's going to bless you mighty as you are resting. Thank you. Praise the Lord. There are three forces that men contend with. The first force you contend with in life are called mountains. The second force you contend with in life are called the winds and the waves. And the third forces you contend with in life are spirits themselves. A mountain comes to stop you from making progress. And the reason is because life itself is a story. The physical body you have is an encasement that allows you access into a reality that is flowing from eternal past into eternal future. You are a dot in reality. And so what mountains come to do is to prevent that migration of the spirit, that transition that God has created for you to experience. And so when you find men that are stagnant in life, it's not because they were not created for great things. It's actually because there are forces in the spirit that are called mountains. And until you are able to uproot them, you can't make progress in life, no matter how educated you are. Men don't go forward because they are smart. Men go forward because they are able to remove mountains from their paths. There are many smart men today that are stranded because mountains impede them from going forward. And so the first force that you must contend with in order to enjoy a transition are the mountains that hinder men from making progress. You don't add another year in the spirit because 365 days is completed. You actually add another year in the spirit when you transit from one level to another. The birthday of a spiritual man is not captured in the chronological migration. The birthday of a spiritual man is captured in the transitions he's able to make in the spirit. Because if a man must make a transition, a mountain must be removed. The second force you must overcome in life are the winds and the waves. The winds and the waves don't function like mountains. Whereas mountains stop you from making progress, the winds and the waves come after you have made very good progress because the idea is to uproot what you have planted. Why mountains stop you from moving, the winds and the waves come to destroy your foundation. And the Bible said, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And Jesus said, when you build, ensure to build on the rock. He said, because a time will come when the winds and the waves will come boisterously to hit against what you have built. And so that you are making progress today is not eternal assurance. Eternal assurance is only achieved when your foundation is a rock that cannot be moved. And so if you are not built on the rock, you can be uprooted even after many years of progress. The third thing that you must deal with are the spirits that manipulate the affairs of men. The Bible said, the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He said, but I am come that you might have life and life to the full. Now, these three forces I have outlined. There is no wisdom you can have or study from anywhere in the world that will give you the ability to deal with them. Because they are invincible forces. You may be a graduate of Harvard. You may be connected to a president. And you may be working in the best institution in the world. When a spiritual mountain comes... It will frustrate everything you do. And it will come to a point where you will wonder why things are not working. Because all the integers around you will suggest that you should be the best in what you are doing. You can make progress for 30 years and all of a sudden, like the story of Job, a wind can come and shatter the foundation and things go down. So the forces we deal with are not primarily physical. The forces we deal with are primary, primarily spiritual. So when he said, by my spirit... He is trying to reveal to you that as a mortal man, you are contending with things that are spiritual and eternal. So if all your advantage is in the flesh, you are defeated before you started. By my spirit is a humbling statement that you are intelligent but put your intelligence aside when you want to discuss matters of destiny. By my spirit is a suggestion to you that all the advantages you have in the flesh, when a spirit is involved, it becomes a disadvantage. 
It's only in the context of a spirit that your strength can become weakness. It's only in the context of spiritual realities that your wisdom can become weakness. Except the Holy Spirit is granted the right of way. There can be no progress in any man's life. Anything happening to him can become a mirage when the spirit takes over. I heard a story of a family doing very well, excelling in every aspect until they were traveling to the village for a ceremony. And then a witch was sent on IT. First son, 30 years, second, 28 years, all of them graduates. And a witch, a small witch, 18 year old girl, went for IT. And unfortunately, her IT session that day was with the family car. And so while they, she was passing, they were teaching her how to cast spares. And the spare she cast was to cause the car to somersault. Now, this is a professor of neurosurgery. But even though he had studied everything about the brain, when a witch was involved, human intelligence became futile. So when the Bible begins to admonish us that it has to be by the Spirit, it's a testimony you cannot extract from a university. For you to make eternal progress in life, it must be by the Spirit. The reason is because the foundation of reality is in the Spirit. God does not walk except as a spirit goes to walk. And so every time a man must sustain or build insurance in the spirit or in life, he must lay hold of the spirit. The foundation of reality is the word and the spirit. If the spirit is not at work, everything you call progress is a failure. The problem is that you are in time, so you have not calculated the totality of reality. When you come into time, reality is fragmented. Because in the spirit, what you call yesterday is now. And what you call tomorrow is also now. But because you are in time, you are forced to split your reality into a chronological sequence. And so you are here. You don't know that the beings you are dealing with are already in tomorrow. And they are also in yesterday. So you may make the mistake of judging your life by where you are standing momentarily. If you don't enter the spirit, you cannot make progress. Because your tomorrow is also now. And the problem is that they, were, they are standing in tomorrow in reality. But you tomorrow have not come. So you are judging your today as your advantage. Whereas, if your tomorrow is not included, today was a failure. It only took time, only blinded you. And so before we make progress in life, we must come back to understand what the spirit is about. Because the spirit is the foundation of reality. In dealing with reality, as touching the spirit... There are two laws that govern its operation. I'm a, I'm a forerunner. <laughs> it's tomorrow I will teach. <laughs> I'm just trying to stir the waters. There are two realities that govern eternal progress as far as destiny is concerned. The first reality is weaved into an economy we call the economy of intimacy. And the second reality is weaved into an economy that we call the principles of the kingdom. The principles of the kingdom are earthly, but their foundation is in the spirit. I'm trying to explain something. I'm trying to explain a simple point that until the Holy Ghost goes to work, nothing works. And the two ways of mobilizing the power of the Holy Spirit is either by taking advantage of the economy of intimacy or by taking advantage of the economy of, economy of principles. The reason it is so is because... Intimacy is the ability to deploy power from the heavens. Why principles is the ability to deploy power from the earthly realm. And for man to be complete in his manifestation, he must touch the reality of the heavens and he must also touch the reality of the earth. The reason is because the earth is an offspring of the heavens. The heavens is what produced the earth. The reality we see and know today were crystallized from the heavenlies. And you will know this to be true when you study the scriptures. In Genesis chapter 2 from verse 4, the Bible said when the earth was created, when the civilization of the earth was created, it said it was it was the word is like vomited from the reality of the spirit realm. And so the principles that hold the earth realm produces an alignment order that makes the earth relevant so long as it is aligned in the spirit. And the principles that run the spirit realm is operational to the degree that it is aligned to God. That means the earth aligns to the spirit and the spirit aligns to God. Now, when man was brought into the equation, this is the intelligence that governed man. Man was created 
different from every other being. Man was created to live in the spirit and in the earth at the same time. So when God created the man, the first faculty of man God created was his spirit. But the man was not designed to live in the spirit. If the man was designed to live in the spirit, that would have been enough. Because that's how the angelic realm was created. And I'm not going to go into that now. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God said, let there, he said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Theologians said the word make there is the word para. That means to form out of nothing. So man came from within God. And because man came from within God, it is where God dwells that the man will dwell. And so when God created that man in Genesis 1.26, he was nowhere because he was in God. He came from within God, so he lives only where God dwells. So there was nowhere to put the man. Now, after God created that man, God now went to create all other things he wanted to do. And he came in Genesis 2, 7. And the Bible said God took the dust from the ground. And he said he formed the man. And the man he created from himself, he now planted him into the man he created from the dust. And the Bible said the convergence between the spirit man and the earthly man became a living soul. So the living soul is a bridge between the spirit and the natural. So for the living soul to make impact in time, there must be a contribution from the spirit man and there must be a contribution from the earthly man. If that does not take place, the man cannot dominate the earth realm. Why spirits run on one life? Animals also run on one life. Man runs on three lives. He's a, he's a strange creature. The spirit life is in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. If man touch that life, he begins to live from the spirit realm like a god. The natural life, which is from the dust of the earth, is in the blood. In Leviticus 17 verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The soulish life is in his breath. He said he breathed into the man, the man became a living soul. So for a man to function correctly, he must be planted in the spirit through intimacy. And he must be planted in the earth realm through principles. The foundation of the earth is not a rock. The foundation of the earth are laws. They are principles. And any man who is not planted on principles cannot dominate this realm. The foundation of the spirit is the breath of God. And so any man who does not connect to God through intimacy cannot live from that realm. So when a man wants to make progress, he needs to formulate this alignment order accurately so that the Holy Ghost can flow through him. That is when that man can have victory. Now, because you are spirit, an aspect of you must be built completely on intimacy. And because you are mortal, an aspect of you must be built completely on principles. There are people today that live by principles and they live by principles alone. And when a mystery is concocted from the spirit realm, it cuts them off. There are other people today that live by the spirit and they live by the spirit alone. And even though they are highly spiritual, like Lazarus, they fail in life. There is a power that is activated through intimacy and there is a power that is activated into by activating principles. Both power are the power of the Holy Spirit. When you want to see the Holy Ghost at work in your life, you must activate intimacy. When you want to see the Holy Ghost at work in your life, you must activate principle. One is from the earth realm, another is from the heavenly realm. By my spirit is not a scripture to quote. By my spirit is a protocol. The protocol of intimacy that mobilizes the Holy Ghost from the heavens and the protocol of principles that mobilizes the Holy Ghost from the earth. Every man you see that is invincible knows how to mobilize these two dimensions of power. There are many Christians today, they've been in church for many years, but they know nothing about intimacy. The spirit realm is alien to them. And so when demons want to mess up their life, they can do it at will. There are other men who are in church today, they have no principle they are standing on. And because they have no principle they are standing on, they are still vulnerable. When spirits come, they just shake the foundation of the earth. And when they cause them to compromise, a little compromise takes them out of their destiny. And they are wondering, they say, God, where are you? If you heard God, he will tell you, I am on my throne. The power 
is in the spirit activated by intimacy and the power is in the earth activated by principle. Whichever one you want to use, activate it. It's your choice. So by my spirit is a life. By my spirit is a protocol. By my spirit is an ordinance in the spirit realm. Now, because I don't have so much time, let me explain to you two things that happen when you want to mobilize the power of the Holy Ghost through intimacy and one thing that happens when you want to mobilize the power of the Holy Ghost through principle. So somebody will leave you and just go with that, you know, from the meeting, at least before God's servant comes. When a man begins to provoke intimacy, the first thing that opens him to the power of the Holy Spirit, remember, our anchor team is by my spirit. That means nothing works except by my spirit. No mountain will be removed except by my spirit. No wind will be stopped except by my spirit. No demon, no spirit, no opposition can be shut down except by my spirit. And until mountains are removed, winds are shut down, and demons are held at bay, destiny cannot be numbered. So by my spirit is an emphasis that is activated through intimacy and through principle. And when you begin to journey in intimacy, the way the power of the Holy Ghost is activated is through certain well-coordinated realities. A lot of people engage the spirit realm, but because they don't know what activates the power, they don't pay attention to it. For example, there is a prayer movement brooding now in the spirit. And many people are praying. And they pray and just pray. Prayer has become a time reality. Prayer has become a posture-based reality. And so you see people praying, they lift up plastic chairs. Plastic chairs will not, lifting plastic chairs will not add value to your life. You see people praying, they are distracted. Even when worship is going on intensely, people are recording so that they can upload on Instagram. And so they are in a very intense atmosphere. They don't know what to take out of that place because they don't know how the power is mobilized. You can be in God's presence and sink. You can be in God's presence and die. You can be in an intense prayer meeting and die. Because that prayer is going on does not mean the spirit is at work. There are certain things you must touch in prayer that mobilizes the power of the spirit. And when a man wants to generate power through intimacy, the first place he must journey to is the realm of the voice of God. When God speaks, the power of the spirit is activated. If you have prayed and have not heard God, keep praying. If you are worshipping and you have not heard God, keep worshipping. If you are singing and you have not heard God, keep singing. A prayer without the voice of God is useless. A worship session without the voice of God is unprofitable. That's why people say, I have prayed, I have done everything. Why is it not working? It's not the prayer that changes things. It's the voice of God that changes things. The prayer is only a gateway. The prayer is only an access point. The prayer is a portal that you activated in order to arrive where the voice of God dwells. Because he said the voice of God is upon many waters. The waters are the dimensions of the spirit. He said the voice of God thundered. He divided the flames of fire. He said he causes the hinds to carve. That means the authority and the majesty of God is encapsulated in the voice of God. And so when a man wants to touch the voice of God, he begins to look for spiritual vehicles that help him to travel there because this king doesn't shout everywhere. He dwells in the midst of the coast of fire. He said, God, we ascend from the secret place of thunder. There are men that know the economy of the voice. And so every time life begins to turn to a mirage, they begin to look for the voice of God. There are many of them that will go to a hiding point and pray for weeks and pray for months. They are not coming out to tell you how long they prayed. What they are going to apprehend is the voice. And when God speaks, even if it's a whisper, it's enough. The story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, the guy had spoken, go home, you will hear the sound of an abundance of rain. His prophetic ministry has been challenged. If the rain doesn't come, he's a fake prophet. What we make what I said come to pass, he went to the mountain. And the Bible said he put his head between his thigh. And he was praying. He was praying. He was waiting for signal. The power was not in the prayer. The power was in the voice. Many people pride themselves in fasting. Many people pride themselves in prayer. Many people pride themselves in worship. But they don't know why their life is a contradiction. The reason is because they don't know that prayer is a journey. And when wise men begin to pray, they start traveling. That's why sometimes when we pray, we add fasting. Because we know that we are praying, but we are not traveling fast enough. There is noise in our head. Sometimes when we pray, we add a chant. 
Sometimes when we pray, we add music. The reason is because we are trying to remove everything, de-escalate every noise, de-escalate every distraction. That by all means, when we come to the mountain where the voice of God dwells, the Bible spoke about Moses. He took him 40 days. He kept climbing. Because that voice is somewhere. And until your spirit finds it, ah, the spirit cannot walk. The spirit will only begin to walk when you hear the voice of God. In Ezekiel chapter 2 from verse 2, he said, as I saw him, I fell like a dead man. He said, but as he spake, he said, the word entered, the spirit entered into me and carried me to my feet. That means the answer was not just the presence. The answer was the speaking. Because he fell as a dead man in the presence of the throne of God. What revived him was not that he was before the throne. What revived him was not the likeness of the cherubims. Because before he fell as a dead man, he saw the cherubims. He said he saw them, they carried the throne of God. They moved like thunder and lightning. He said their similitude, he began to describe them for 28 verses. But with the greatness of the cherubim, he still fell down. What lifted him to his feet was when the voice was spoken. Because the spirit can't travel until the voice is uttered. The spirit begins to travel when the voice is uttered. There is something about your destiny that you have been crying for. The spirit can't walk until the voice comes forth. I know you are looking for breakthrough. I know you are looking for something. I know that the devil is playing around your corner. And I know you are angry with the devil. But the spirit can't move until the voice comes. This is why we set a command tower, either through prayer or fasting, that by all means, any signal that comes from heaven, we will catch it. And the moment you catch it, you become invincible. Ah, you become invincible. The easiest way to progress in life is to hear the voice of God. Nothing is difficult when you hear the voice. It can level mountains. It can cause oceans to divide. It can cause quails to come from nowhere to the wilderness and give you more than enough. When they walked through the wilderness, they walked in abundance. Because abundance was an economy in the voice. The day the voice shuts down, that day you begin to die. And so if you want the Holy Ghost to constantly walk in your life, the secret is access to the voice. How much of it do you have? You are not rich because you have a billion in your account. No. You are rich because the voice of God dwells with you. That's what wealth is in the spirit. Money is not wealth. It's the economy of the voice that provokes wealth. Can we please celebrate God's servant. Our dad is in the house. Prophet Amos Fenwa. And come on. You want to shout? God's choice apostle is around. Celebrate apostle Joshua Selma. really an honor to have you sir please be seated can you imagine inspiration is beginning to dry off <laughs> i was so worried before now be careful hope this thing i'm saying is not wrong <laughs> don't worry if i'm wrong i will go back to the apostolic college and be instructed more correctly. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. And so wealth is not money. Wealth is how much of the voice of God you have. When the voice of God is spoken in your direction, it can cause the hind to carve. It can discover the mysteries of the forest. It can go to the belly of the sea and bring the wealth to you. And so the first way to activate the operation of the Holy Ghost is to join in the spirit until you find the voice. Prayer is not powerful in itself. Except as prayer is a vehicle for accessing where the voice dwells. And that's why wise men of old, what they do is that they join in the spirit. When they are worshipping, they are not singing necessarily. They know that that song is a vehicle. When they are praying, they are not just carrying out a religious activity. There are many religions that pray. But only the prayer of the spirit carries us to where the voice dwells. And so when we are done praying, we don't come out as prayer champions. We come out with voices. We come out with verdicts. We come out with oracles. We come out with mysteries. And the mysteries we come out with make us commanders on the face of the earth. And so the first thing and the first protocol that gives a man an eternal advantage is access to the voice of God. That's why intimacy becomes a, a vehicle and a reality of the spirit that no Christian can tamper with. If you joke with it, you are gone. If it's going to be by the Spirit, 
then it will be by intimacy. Because intimacy is the vehicle to the voice. And when the voice comes, things change. Nobody is disadvantaged. When you find a man who is disadvantaged, is bereft of the voice. The moment the voice comes, he becomes a champion. Praise God. I came to be blessed. <laughs> I don't want us to tamper with one second of Apostle's time. Because <laughs> I came to be blessed. Please, let's reduce my time to two minutes. I want to leave here. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so for the spirit to walk, intimacy must be set up. If that pillar is not there, the Spirit of God cannot walk. The second thing that happens when we begin to dig into intimacy is that the government of God is activated. The government of God cannot walk on a man except as he submits.